Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I've been thinking about what kind of content to do, and I thought to myself, what if I do something on Mutin? This is because during Lent term I took part in a Mutin competition. This was something organised by the Human Rights Law Society at the University of Cambridge. Cambridge is where I'm currently studying law at. The competition lasted for three rounds, and spoiler for those who haven't watched my vlogs. By the way, if you haven't watched those vlogs, go and check uh, those out and then come back and watch this video because, spoiler alert, I won that competition, which I did not expect. Mutant is something I haven't took part a lot uh, since my, I got to university. I did a bit at the start of first year, but I hadn't really done a lot since, so the Human Rights Law Moot was probably the first main competition that I took part in, and I'm definitely glad that I did. So if you're interested in the law, interested in mooting, curious about what mooting actually is, or perhaps you're in self-isolation, like I might to be, by the time this video comes out. Uh, I hope this you, you'll find this video useful, I hope you'll find this video entertaining and at least a bit of insight into what a mutin actually involves. So what is mutin? Mutin is, um, in a way, it's fictitious court proceedings. And what I mean by that is quite often in mutin competitions, you will receive a fictitious scenario. This may be based on a case that's been in court recently or something that's been in the news. And so they've taken a, you know, a scenario based on what has been in the news. And it'll be up to you to work out what you're arguing, prepare your arguments, present the prepare a skeleton, and then obviously present your actual oral arguments before a judge or judges. Those judges could be your lecturer, they could be a senior uh, barrister, for example, for the human rights law moot. In the final round, uh, the two judges were actually two barristers from two different chambers. And so the moot overall is an opportunity for you to develop some quite useful skills, especially if you're interested in being a barrister or you're interested in some kind of career where you know, you'll need to have these good oral skills because it's, it's a good opportunity to develop those useful skills, whether that be organisational skills, so you know, learn how to organise things, you know, managing your time, so as you imagine preparing your mood alongside your studies, for example. It's an opportunity to develop confidence, but the key thing is it's an opportunity to develop uh, oral skills, the ability to clearly articulate and clearly present your arguments before a judge or judges. And so, yeah, Mutant is a really good chance uh, to develop those skills. But it's also a good opportunity to get some insight into actually the work of uh, a barrister or someone who works in a court because obviously you're seeing uh, the application of the law, not just learning the law. So if you're learning law as part of a degree or if you're just someone who knows someone who's learning the law as part of a degree, actually it's a good opportunity to uh, see the law in practice as it were. And quite often in competitions, I know this is here in Cambridge, you can take part in competitions even if you're not a law student yourself. And that's a really good chance for those who are thinking about the law but didn't want to do a law degree yet. Uh, it's a good opportunity for the, you and for people to see what the law involves and actually might inspire you to go into the law later on in life. So it's a good opportunity there. So it's not just the skills, but actually it's the insight as well. And so in these videos, like I mentioned, I'm going to just talk about what routine involves and some of the steps that go into it. And I thought in this particular video, I would talk about the steps that go from reading the scenario and know what you need to do to developing what is known as a skeleton. Looking at the scenario, the first thing that will happen is you'll get the scenario. And there's a couple of things that you need to understand uh, and know uh, before you can even prepare any arguments or start doing research or anything like that, is you need to know a couple of things. So first of all, you need to know what role you've got. What I mean by that is, so for example, in the human rights law mood, there were four roles. There was the senior appellant, uh, junior appellant, senior respondent, and uh, junior respondent. The appellants are those who are on, who are representing the side that is appealing the decision. So, for example, if the scenario says Jones uh, is appealing the decision of the court or law, i.e., you know, he dis disagrees with the court and so wants you know the court above to hear his case again, then the appellants are those who are going to be representing Jones. They are they are represent the side that wants to appeal the decision below. Respondents are those who are, in a way, replying to that appeal, and they are their job is to try and convince the upper, you know, the upper court, you know, why they should essentially agree with the court below and reject the arguments being made by, on appeal by the appellants. So it's important that you need to know like what role you've got. Quite often in a moot competition, there'll be at least 
two grounds of appeal. And the seniors will deal with the first ground of appeal and the juniors will deal with the second uh, ground of appeal. So you need to know who, who you are. Are you the junior respondent? Are you the senior appellant? And you need to know what role uh, you have got. The senior appellant quite often uh, will have the right to reply during all uh, arguments, but I'll talk about it a little bit more in that video. Uh, so you need to know what role you've got. You also need to know what court you're in. What I'm talking about in terms of the UK Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, might not be familiar with uh, you, but a similar idea will apply depending on what uh, country you are in. Essentially, you've got to know what court you are in. And that's quite important because, for example, if you are in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court being the highest court in the land here in the UK, quite often you are able to present uh, policy arguments, whereas in the Court of Appeal, that is the court below the Supreme Court. But that's more, but really they're more concerned about the uh, arguments based on the facts of the scenario. Policy arguments are not necessarily going to work or be as effective or be as weighty in the Court of Appeal. And plus the Court of Appeal, given that they are a lower court, means that they are lower in the judicial uh, ranking. And what I mean by that is you can't really say to the Court of Appeal, you must overrule the, this decision of the Supreme Court because they can't do that. Only the Supreme Court can overrule the decision of the Supreme Court. And so it's important to know what court you're in, because that'll determine, might, or might determine, the arguments that you need to present. And of course, the obvious, and when you look at a scenario, is you need to understand the scenario. So what you need to do, what's quite useful, I found useful, is to go through the scenario uh, once, and then to go through it again, highlight through the key facts, and then look at the the grounds of appeal and look at what ground your argument. So if you, for example, you're the uh, junior appellant, you'll be like a, looking at the second ground of appeal. And so you need to know what you're arguing because you don't want to present the wrong argument uh, because I think that will cause issues. So when you read through the scenario, you'll, you'll break it down afterwards, summarize it into the key facts and make sure that you, in your bundle, you uh, are able to uh, have a summary of the facts and um, so that you can refer to it during the moot. So the first thing is to actually read the scenario carefully and you know know the key facts and know what you are arguing and which court you are before. It then comes to uh, thinking about research and what I mean by that is research and looking at uh, cases, uh, looking at relevant pieces of legislation, because uh, sometimes mooting competitions can refer to a case. So it could be uh, the judge at first instance, either judge who first heard the case, decide on the facts on the basis of a previous case. So what will be important in terms of research is looking at that previous case, looking at whether or not, for example, there might be dissenting judges, looking at whether or not they might have, uh, look at the different reasoning that was given by the court. So for example, if you are appealing against a decision where the judges relied on that case, you might be looking in that case, see if there's any loopholes, anything that you can take advantage of and say, well, so-and-so in this case forgot this or overlooked this or underestimated this or overemphasized that. Because you, you want to also be able to say, well, why you shouldn't rely on this case. Obviously, if you're respondents, you're going to be trying to defend that case and say your judge was right to apply that case because the facts are similar or because the reason is sound or you know whatever your arguments are going to be. So it's important that you look at the case. And it's also when you're doing your research, you need to be looking at similar cases and looking at similar cases on facts or on principle and looking at, again, the reasoning there. If your scenario involves legislation, you might find it useful to look at explanatory notes that explain the, you know, the purpose behind the legislation. Explanatory notes are not as weighty as using cases. Cases are your primary uh, source, but it, it can be useful because it can be useful in terms of the arguments that you might want to make. Just a point on uh, materials um, that you're able to use. In the Human Rights Law Moot, the max was five cases, but that did not include the cases that were referred to in the scenario. So, for example, if there were two cases referred to in the scenario, you would be allowed those two plus five other authorities. And those authorities can be cases, but they could also be uh, articles. So you might if you, for example, you were in the Supreme Court, you could refer to an article by an academic uh, from a university or, or elsewhere. But you, like I said, your primary source of authority will be cases. And so you know, you'll be using like be using websites such as Westlaw or LexisNexis to look for those cases. And 
what you want to do is to make sure that when you're deciding what case you are going to use, that you have a summary of the facts of that case and what was decided in that case. And that's important because you might be asked during oral submissions, remind me of the facts of this case. Or, you know, if you go, I'm going to refer to this case, the judge might say, could you ask, remind me of the facts of those cases? Because I can't quite remember them. So you need to know the facts and know those, those facts well, because the judge might go, well, wasn't this different in this case? Or isn't the difference between that case you're referring to and the present scenario X or Y or Z? For me, is I had a summary of the cases that I eventually did decide to use, some of the facts and what they decided. And so that's important to have. So once you have read the scenario, you've carefully read through it, you've understood what the scenario is about, you understood what you're going to be arguing, and once you've done your research, you need to be thinking about the skeleton. Uh, what is a skeleton? A skeleton is essentially a summary of the arguments that you're going to make during the moot itself. And I've got here my skeleton here from the scenario that I had. This was the scenario for the final round of the human rights law moot. And essentially, as you can see, as it's a maximum of two sides of A4 paper, and it's got my submissions and it's got my authorities. It is structured as, the way I've structured it is in three parts. Now, of course, um, depending on resources that you use, they might advise different ways to structure it. I found this way quite useful. So I've got essentially a background. It's essentially it's a summary of the facts uh, of the scenario, including what, what's been argued now before the court. And then I've got my submissions. So I've got two submissions that I'm uh, making. And then I've got my authorities here and I've listed obviously all the cases uh, that I'm using. And in this one, there's a human rights one element. So I've got the European Convention on Human Rights listed as well. And the key thing with a skeleton is making sure that it's clear and detailed. You want to make sure it's clear for the judge and for opposing counsel. Because what you'll need to have is you'll have a copy for opposing counsel, i.e. your opposite number. You also need a copy for the judge as well. And if your skeleton's all over the place, it's a bit unorganised, it's not consistent grammar or whatever, then the judge is going to find it really confusing and not, it's not going to be able to work it out, not going to be able to understand or follow through when you're making your oral submission. So it's important to make sure that it's clearly presented. So this is my first submission here. I put it in bold because that's you know this is my main submission. And then I've got my supplementary points that I want to make. Uh, basically the points that I want to make as part of that first submission. And I've also put the cases that I'm going to be using and the paragraphs. So in your first submission, I was going to be referred to the case of El Husky at paragraphs 82 and 83. And that's helping the judge, you know, Obviously anticipates that you're obviously going to during your submissions refer to those cases at that particular point and that's been clear and it's been organized and having well spaced out and so i think i have like 1.5 spacing and it's all structured neatly so that the judge can follow through your opposing counsel can follow through it it needs to be detailed as well and you know you don't want just bare bones because then no one's going to be able to understand for what, what you're arguing but obviously you want to be able to, you don't want to put too much on it because it'll look unprofessional and be, obviously you want to have the appropriate level of detail on it. And so obviously your skeleton needs to just be clear and obviously make sure that it's obviously checked the spelling and grammar, etc. One other thing you need to think about in terms of developing your skeleton, one thing you need to think about is timing. One thing that I noticed in after my first round was that I had three submissions, three points that I wanted to make, but I was only really able to cover two during the actual moot itself because I ran out of time. And so it's important when you're developing your skeletons to think about timing, because obviously you need to make sure that you're not only able to present your submissions, but also you need to think about time that might be taken up by the judge asking you a question, intervening during your points to get something clarified or ask a question or to probe a little bit on a point that you've just made. So think about when you're developing your skeleton time. I know that might be hard because you just you can't anticipate the judge intervening. The judge might inter you might have a judge that intervenes a lot, uh, or doesn't intervene too much. It will depend on what you argue as well and how you argue it. But you need to just take that into into consideration. So what I end up doing in the following two rounds of the human rights law moon, as I only really had two submissions, at least that made it a bit easier uh, to try and get it done within the time. It didn't fully work because I did slightly go over of time still in those rounds, but it did make it easier because then I wasn't trying to rush through and get 
three submissions across. The other thing, of course, with uh, skeletons is your first submission is kind of the main submission that you want to make, the main point that you want to get across. And the second submission, if you, for example, have two, is sometimes can be an alternative one. And it basically, it will run like, if your lordship, your ladyship does not accept submission one, we have submission two as a, as a backup in case submission one doesn't succeed. It's important that you have, you know, different submissions. They're not obviously one submission just repeating what the first submission uh, said, because that's not presenting any new arguments. I'm probably going to end the video here. This is part one of talking about mutin. So I've essentially talked about reading the scenario, doing your research, and forming your skeleton. And probably in the second part, I'm going to talk about, okay, you've got your skeleton. Now you need to prepare for the actual mutin competition that you're going to have, the actual presentation of your oral argument. So I'm going to talk about that. And in the third video, I'm going to talk about the actual mute itself and advice in terms of presenting your oral arguments. I hope you found this video insightful. It might be a bit long, um, but obviously there was a lot to cover. If you found this useful or if you've got any questions still, put them in the comment section below. If there's something I've missed out, if there's something that I should have mentioned that I didn't, remind me, put it in the comment section below. If you've just got any inquiries, put them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, do the usual things, like the video, follow me on Facebook and Instagram. You can subscribe to the channel by clicking the bottom right hand corner and you can hit the notification bell to keep up to date. Share the video, let other people know about it. Hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope to see you in part two.